Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the collapse of civilizations through history. All civilizations collapse, and that will even include our own today that we live in. Our guest for this is a historian who created an incredibly popular podcast called Fall of Civilizations. It's also a video series that could be found on YouTube. Combined, they have well over 100 million views and downloads. And chances are, if you like this program because of the history that we do on it, then and you get your media online, well, then you're probably familiar with Fall of Civilizations. My guest is Paul Cooper. He writes, produces, and hosts Fall of Civilizations, which has also now been adapted into a book by the same name, Fall of Civilizations, Stories of Greatness, and decline. Paul Cooper, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thank you so much for having me on, Mitch. It's remarkable to me, and I think in recent years I'm I'm starting to see this more and more, and I very much believe you capture this with a number of civilizations that you write about, how important the environment is is when it comes to civilizations both for the rise of a civilization and then how important it is especially when environment changes when even climate changes how important environment is at least at the very least in helping cause stressors to a civilization that then would lead you know to to more incidents happening that could potentially lead to an end of a civilization The environment is supremely important when discussing the rise and fall of any civilization. We might even say that the entire function of a civilization is to solve the problems provided by its own environment. Or we might look at a civilization like the Yucatan Maya, who grew up in one of the most challenging environments in the world, the Yucatan Peninsula. It's a a karstic peninsula in the south of what is today Mexico uh, and Honduras. And... It has no rivers. It's an extremely porous landscape where uh, water is almost immediately absorbed into the rock and down into a a twisting warren of sinkholes and caverns called cenotes. Now, the Maya had to solve the problems of this environment in order to build their society. And they did this by uh, building large tanks to gather water. They did this by building raised fields that were irrigated using channels and canals. And in this way, we can see that their entire society organized around solving the problems of the environment. And we see this story countless times in all the societies we've looked at over the course of our series. That's interesting. So so they they, they weren't near some major river or, or anything like, like you would see with Egypt or, or countless other civilizations? No, in fact, that makes them quite unique, um, and the landscape itself quite unique. Um, a karstic landscape is uh, essentially a landscape that is built out of sedimentary ro- rocks, usually usually limestone, and it's exceptionally poor at creating the kinds of channels that uh, you need to create a river. So there's one large river, the Uzamacinta, but um, mostly you see just these underground caverns um, and large sinkholes full of water that for the Maya were very sacred places. Uh, places where sacrifices could take place, places where they felt they could contact the the other world, the world of spirits and gods. So technology. Technology is also an important Mm -hmm. part of the story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, human society is is somewhere between a machine and a biological organism. You know, they have aspects like a machine that are consciously designed by the people who create them. But like an organism, they also adapt and evolve to their environment. They are shaped by their environment, and uh, the particular features they take on are in some ways determined by it. For this reason, in so many societal collapses we look at, the story is that the environment began to change, that just like a a butterfly or a bird that was uh, adapted to a particular environment, if, uh, if that changes too rapidly, then the organism is unable to adapt, and we see uh, increasing stress being placed on it. We see increasing uh, fractures begin to begin to show. And what we see in so many societies is what we call a cascading systems collapse. This occurs in any system, be it a combustion engine or a human body uh, or you know a large society, where one aspect of the system begins to collapse under stress. And once it collapses, it passes its stress onto other parts of the system that are in turn overloaded. This causes a cascading failure right through the system. One really interesting example we looked at was the Khmer Empire of Cambodia. 
who rose up in the Middle Ages, uh, also in a you know particularly fascinating hydraulic environment. Uh, they they grew up in the the valley of the Mekong River, which is one of the longest rivers in Asia, uh, and near a large lake called Tonle Sap. Now this lake is amazing because in the the flood season, the rainy season, the Mekong actually uh, actually stops the lake from draining and instead the the direction of the river changes and the mekong fills this lake uh it, it the water level rises so high that the people around the lake have to build their houses on stilts that are you know sometimes 10 meters high uh just just in order to avoid the, the water flooding them and the Khmer were able to solve the challenges of this environment by similarly building uh, a hydraulic city now that's a city that has intricate systems of canals, inlets, waterways, and reservoirs that that protect the city from flooding, that channel the water into where it needs to be, and also allows them to fill tanks, bathing pools, water reservoirs, and allows them to use the water for, for useful purposes rather than you know flooding the city. Now, as the uh, Middle Ages went on, as we got into the 15th century, this system started to break down. No number of reasons for this. Uh, it's speculated that there could have been you know, perhaps plague arrived in the city. They were being challenged by powerful new rivals in the region, like the Thai kingdom of Ayutthaya, these powerful trading confederates on, on the coasts uh, that were reducing the amount of uh, commerce passing through the city of Angkor. But what this led to is that there were increasingly few amounts of people who were able to maintain this intricate water system. And also a series of droughts began to strike this region. This was a series of mega droughts that were also followed by periods of intense rainfall. So we're not only getting some of the driest uh, decades in, in you know, recent centuries or recent millennia, but then also the wettest decades wedged in between them. It sounds like California. These people were forced. So right, yeah. like California we, we have that feeling sometimes in the UK too. Um, but what this led to was uh, a kind of fluctuating stress on the system that it simply couldn't withstand. During the drought, the people of the city of Angkor would rush to narrow the channels, uh, meaning that the water running down from the hills would reach the city in a kind of faster flow. It was more concentrated. Um, but then when the rainy months came, the deluge came, these narrow channels sent water flooding into the city, overwhelmed the reservoirs, and the city flooded. They would then rush to you know, build higher banks around their reservoirs to contain this, this mass of water. But then the drought returned and they'd have to undo all that work again. This repeated stress uh, caused by the environmental changes of that time uh, led to the steady abandonment of the city. And today you can visit these crumbling ruins in, in, in Cambodia uh, that are really, really striking. In, in the stressors that this causes on society, then naturally also causes strife internal strife mm -hmm. political strife yeah. and and i mm -hmm. you know sometimes when i think about it and i think about history and we'll talk about some of these examples in time it also i think when i think about the 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 internal conflicts that at least we have in the united states maybe that you have uh in the united kingdom i, I also start to think about is is there an element of the environment that's creating more stress in a society that actually m creates more than political strife Mm. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the the stress that the environment can introduce into any society, um, I'm just talking now about ancient societies, yeah. uh, is, is obviously huge. People who lived agricultural, uh, you know, people who lived in subsistence agriculture societies were absolutely dependent on things like the fl annual flooding of the river, the, you know, the rains coming. Uh, animals you know moving on their annual migrations and disruptions to these cycles could cause immense problems to people they could cause starvation population collapse and all kinds of calamities and even though today we're very familiar with the the, the specter of climate change that that is threatening our society in the coming century the climate has always suffered various you know local variations Climate has always been a fragile, chaotic system that even small changes to, to its balance can cause immense knock-on effects. Uh, 
We might look at as well at the Greenland Vikings, who are. Um, we might look as well at the, the Greenland Norse, who were a settlement on the southern tip of Greenland in the Middle Ages, and they were the first uh, Europeans to set foot on what we might think of as the North American continent. They'd crossed uh, from Europe to Iceland and then on to Greenland, and even made forays down the coast of, of Newfoundland and Canada. And they were able to do this partly because they were exploring during a period called the medieval warm period. This was a slight period of warming. Um, it was possibly caused by variations in the sun's activity during this time. But it meant that Greenland uh, was slightly more habitable. They were able to uh, you know, raise cattle, sheep, um, some crude crops and survive on, on seal hunting and, and fishing. But as the medieval warm period came to an end, Europe uh, and the North Atlantic went through a period of cooling. We see this in the uh, ice fairs of the Elizabethan period, when uh, Londoners could actually walk out onto the Thames and hold fairs and festivals uh, out on the river, something we you know, never see today. But for the Norse uh, uh, Greenlanders, this, this spelled disaster. Suddenly, the uh, narrow strip of land they were able to inhabit got smaller and smaller. And as time went on, the settlements were abandoned until eventually they stopped paying their annual uh, tax of, of walrus ivory to, uh, to Norway, to the Norwegian king. And he sent someone there to find out what had happened to them. Why aren't they paying their taxes anymore? He found abandoned farmhouses, you know, some people you know, dead inside their farms. Uh, they, they'd refused to leave. And others, we presume, simply sailed back to Europe. Sometimes it's been slightly fancifully suggested that others went to North America and uh, dispersed there, you know, um, it, you know, went went on to uh, intermarry with with indigenous populations there, and um, simply became part of that milieu. But we can never really know the answer for sure. That's fascinating. It reminds me of a recent interview we did with an American historian, Kathleen Duval, who wrote mm -hmm. the book native nations and she writes about the civilizations that existed within the the modern day united states um hundreds of years before europeans ever arrived arrived to mm -hmm. the continent and uh, she writes a lot about the the, the Miss mississippian uh civilizations mm -hmm. cahokia mm -hmm. um yeah. and i think it's near st louis and mm -hmm. and one thing that she writes is that there comes a time after you know environmental change is also a part of this, but there came a time with it, and for most Americans we're not even fully aware that we had fully formed civilizations that we'd recognize mm -hmm. as cities on par with other cities of their time around the world in the within the content within the the borders of modern day United States, mm -hmm. but that these the the people who inhabited these cities eventually rejected them and abandoned mm -hmm. them and left them hundreds of years even before uh, Europeans arrived to the continent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the Mississippi was the, the Nile of North America. It was a, a highway along which trade passed up and down. It, um, as you say, gave rise to these amazing mound building civilizations uh, like, you know, like, like those at Cahokia. Um, but, you know, there are also things like the Anasazi culture of the Puebloans in the, um, the Southwest. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a kind of uh, stereotype or folk wisdom that, that there weren't these complex, uh, you know, interconnected societies in North America. Uh, you know, people imagine, uh, uh, you know, transigent, uh, you know, populations of hunter-gatherers, but, but some of these people were engaged in complex agriculture and, and, uh, and really distinctive trading practices as well. Paul Cooper, you, you begin the book, Fall of Civilizations, um, with Sumer. T tell me how Sumer fits into this pattern and and do it's always argue i i guess I, I i hear arguments all the time what's the first civilization most people see sumer as as the first civilization though you have arguments for egypt and you have other arguments for settlements much much older than these that you find in turkey and, and some other places mm -hmm. for I, I guess i'm asking you two questions here do you think it's correct to see sumer i guess we're talking around 3000 bce or so as being what we consider to be the first civilization yeah, I mean, there's a very good reason why Sumer is uh, typically considered the first civilization, and that's because they were the first people that we know of to write down words on clay tablets. It's almost like um, like 
a star coming coming into life. Uh, like the human populations were accumulating and accumulating um, in larger and larger settlements for thousands of years. And we, we have proto cities like you mentioned at Gobekli Tepe, places like Chattel Hoyuk, which are um, unplanned uh, mishmash of, of, uh, of houses built one on top of each other. There are no streets even. People have to walk over the rooftops. There's no city planning. There's no seemingly central authority. It's a kind of chaotic uh, mishmash that looks something like a, a favela, you know, in, in Rio de Janeiro. Um, it was uh, vernacular architecture with no no king, seemingly, no church, no, no royalty. Uh, and cities like this seemingly existed for thousands of years. Um, Gobekli Tepe, it was probably the beginning of hunter-gatherers starting to build you know, stone settlements. And somewhere like Chattel Hoyuk, um, a couple of thousand years later, is, is more like a, like a shanty town. But for the next, uh, and that's uh, so 8,000 BC, but for the next uh, maybe 4,000 years, you get increasingly sophisticated accumulations of people and also an increasing concentration of authority in you know, a, a class of kind of priest kings, people in whom the religious authority and political authority are united. And any of these really could be considered cities. It's a question like how long is a piece of string? What makes a true city? Um, but people tend to make the distinction between proto-cities where there's no urban planning and true cities where you have a kind of central authority planning out streets, you know, drainage. Uh, you know, in some sense, there's uh, an intelligent plan behind, behind its construction. And in Sumer, we get the first real cities. Uh, and they grow and grow. Uh, they create increasingly sophisticated systems of irrigation in order to you know, increase the agricultural potential of what is a pretty arid and inhospitable land in, in southern Iraq. And it's almost like the gravity of these people growing and growing together, like the, the growth of a, a star, eventually reaches a critical mass where light bursts into being, that light being the creation of the written word, which to us as historians is like light flooding the whole period. Suddenly, it's like the radio turning on. Suddenly voices are speaking to you out of history from the deep past telling you about grain shipments, about you know what the production of a certain factory was like, uh, telling the deeds of great kings, their conquests, their wars, their struggles, their deaths, their names, most importantly. you know We don't have the names of a single historical character before this happens. And hmm. from this moment on, we can hear the voices of people who lived now 5,000 years ago, and they begin to write literature, literature like the Epic of Gilgamesh, the first true story. Yeah, the, the, the complete story, first, I guess, mm. for a beginning to end story that, that we have, the Epic of, of mm. Gilgamesh. You, you spent time in Iraq. Yeah, that's right. I visited Iraq twice as um, part of my PhD in 2016. And, and your PhD is, is, is about ruins and how people relate react to ruins yeah that's right yeah my phd looked at how the ruin is represented in art and literature it looks at how particular ruins have been used throughout history and i particularly looked at the ruin of babylon um which is considered the mother of all cities uh, poetically you know babylon was the uh center of the babylonian empire it was part of uh, the Assyrian Empire was conquered by Alexander, the Achaemenid Empire, and through all of these periods has meant different things to different people. You know, to the Hebrew poets who wrote the Bible, it was a place of oppression um, and uh, and tyranny. You know, it was a place where uh, where you know slaves were taken to and exiled. Uh, but then in the colonial period, it becomes a kind of um, a, a different thing. You know, the, the, the Ishtar Gate of Babylon is shipped brick by brick to Berlin, where it still stands in the Pergamon Museum. And so you now have a, uh, a, a facsimile of it built in the actual place um, in Hilla in Iraq, just, just south of Baghdad. So you get this, this strange um, interposition of, of, of what Babylon means, what Babylon is, where is the real Babylon? Uh, so this was a question I kept returning to again and again in my PhD. And for Iraqi uh, 
novelists and filmmakers, the image of Babylon is one they return to over and over again. There's a great Iraqi filmmaker called Muhammad al-Daraji, who has an amazing film called Son of Babylon. It's incredibly tragic. It's about a, a boy and his grandmother who travel from the Kurdish north of, of Iraq down to Baghdad in order to try and find his father, who was imprisoned by the regime. And this is during the fall of, of the Saddam regime. So it's a war-torn landscape. Uh, they're traveling through this uh, landscape of ruins. You know, There's a scene where he's walking through a police station in ruins, uh, trying, to, trying to see what's going on there. They walk through the ruins of a prison, trying to find signs of his father. But at the same time, they are encountering the ruins of the past. And they, they walk through the ruins of Babylon you know, he walks over the top of its walls and it shows the ruins of the modern period and the ruins of the past in this amazing conjunction that that shows us that history is still ongoing, that it's still a process that's happening to this child. Yeah, I, I, for, I, I too love being in play, ruins, ancient ruins, yeah. um, but I also very much enjoy hanging out in abandoned areas, even in modern cities. Mm. Um, yeah, there's just something yeah, about it. Yeah, there's a particular um, fascination today with the ruins of the modern world as well. They have a similar function to ancient ruins in some sense. They, you know, they, they speak of a, an age that's past, of a, a period that is no longer there. And a, a ruin is a is an imaginative space, it's somewhere where your your mind can never be quiet. You know, while we walk around the ruin of a collapsed temple of a, you know, a 2,000 years old or an ancient castle, you are confronted with the world as it once was and as it might have continued to be had things been a little different. You find your mind filling in the gaps in the walls, you know, imagining the upper floors of the castle, you know, the glass in the windows, the people who must have walked up and down these halls, and you can see the evidence of them in the, you know, faded stone, the... Um, you know, the stone steps that look like they've been worn by running water, just the force of people's feet times a thousand years. And this gives us a sense of an amazing paradox that, you know, this ruin has survived the test of time. It, it has, you know, is passed through the ravages of time, but it also shows time's power. It shows what time can do to something. And what's amazing about modern ruins is that they also form a kind of political critique, if you like. You know, if you walk through the ruin of, say, a abandoned factory in Detroit, or a you know coal mining town in South Wales, you are encountered with the idea that history is not a continual system of progress from better to work. Uh, from you're confronted with the fact that history is not a continual system of progress that whole areas are left abandoned, that, you know, industrial heartlands can become depopulated, that uh, capitalism can't always provide for people, that the cruel logic of the market can leave whole populations behind. And so I think there's a particular fascination today with, uh, with the modern ruin. You see it in a genre of uh, Japanese photography called haikyo, where, you know, amazing overgrown modern ruins are, are photographed in this kind of elegiac way, uh, but also in the phenomenon of urban exploration or urbex, where, you know, people enjoy breaking into these abandoned sites and um, kind of spooking themselves out with the, with the strange uncanniness of the abandoned. Have you ever been to Chernobyl? Uh, I haven't, no, I'd love to go. Yeah, I hear. I, I've never been to Chernobyl. I have a friend who did, mm. uh, who went to and did, did a story there actually, and he just said, mm. "Mind blowing. It's 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 crazy." And the one thing I, I also really like about going to modern day ruins, if we we'll if we can call them that, um, is is just sort of the return of of nature, the return, mm. wild plants. People call them weeds, whatever it may be, mm. uh, sprouting yeah. out. Like what happens when a place is, you know, left alone to be? Mm. Yeah, it's um. I think that's definitely one of the aspects that people most find fascinating about the modern ruin, that we exist often in cities where uh, the man-made and the natural are mutually exclusive, where, you know, the uh, concrete buildings have to be maintained by, you know, pulling out any seedlings that take plant in them, that, 
you know, any damp extrusion has to be stopped, you know, any broken window has to be fixed. But once a place is abandoned, nature very, very quickly takes over. In our country, we have a bunch of invasive species uh, like the uh, the Budlia plant, which was imported from China during the uh, Victorian period for its beautiful um, purple flowers. And it's very beloved of butterflies, but it's slowly absolutely taken over our rail network because it loves growing in the kind of hardy ground of, of, of the gravel that's, that's beside the train tracks. Uh, it's extremely virulent. It's extremely virulent. And we also have the sycamore, which was brought from Europe uh, and is not native to the UK, but with its uh, helicopter seeds, it's able to uh, take root on even the, the highest uh, buildings. Uh, it's, it's a real pest. But these are some of the voracious plants that if our cities were abandoned would slowly take over. Sycamore roots would grow and crack whole walls apart. You know, the buddleia would uh, grow all the way up the walls of our, our terraced houses. Uh, you'd see tarmac uh, degrade really quickly uh, as, as you know, small cracks began to appear after about 10 years and then seedlings you know, grew in those. You know, there would be a, a certain beauty to it, I think, seeing nature reclaim our cities. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with historian Paul Cooper. Paul, Paul Cooper is the writer and the the voice behind an incredibly popular podcast called Fall of Civilizations, which can also be found uh, on YouTube. And it has also been uh, put into a book. And you'll tell me if it's correct to say put into a book. Uh, the book is called Fall of Civilizations, Stories of Greatness and Decline. I... I uh, you have a lot of episodes. They're all they're all you know several hours long, deeply researched. I, I suspect that some of that, a lot of that, made it into its book into a book form. With Fall of Civilization. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we uh, so far we've had eighteen episodes of the podcast and video series, and there are fourteen chapters of the book. I think as we began putting the material together into book form, we began to realize that the show had been creating a narrative over time that you know my show zigzags around history uh, with no particular pattern it's not in chronological order we start with the collapse of roman britain and you know most recently looked at ancient egypt uh, but we've zigzagged across history uh, in a slightly chaotic way but as we put the material together we realized that what we had was kind of an account of human history through the lens of societal collapse we found that you can actually tell the story from the very first cities in Sumer, uh, right up to the modern age and the birth of capitalism, just by linking together these stories from one collapse to another. What's amazing is that, uh, what's amazing is that when the city of Carthage was destroyed by the Romans uh, in the second century BC, the Roman general who watched Carthage sacked and burned and you know, completely destroyed, Scipio Emilianus, he is famously supposed to have wept. And uh, the historian who was accompanying him noted that he murmured to himself a line from Homer's Iliad. Uh, this was a line about um, how the wife of Priam had a premonition that one day Troy would be destroyed, that it would be burned and, and ravaged. And the historian who's with Scipio speculates that this line came to him because he's thinking about Rome. He's thinking, you know, in the future, this may happen to my city, my beloved capital, you know, the city that I believe is eternal. And it's this moment of historical sense for this, this general that nothing lasts forever. And about 500, 600 years later, Rome is sacked in 410 AD. But the thing about the Iliad is that it itself goes back to a previous period of collapse and destruction. But the Iliad uh, is a series of stories um, that came out of the oral folklore of what's called the Greek Dark Ages and was written down once this period ended, uh, about um, 800 uh, BC about 800 BC. And the Greek Dark Ages followed a period called the Bronze Age Collapse, which saw the near simultaneous collapse of multiple complex societies around the region, from the Hittites in Anatolia or modern Turkey, 
to uh, the Kassites in Babylon, uh, to city-states like Ugarit uh, and Mitanni, and the old kingdom of Egypt also suffered a period of decline and eventually collapsed. The Mycenaean Greeks, uh, who are one of the you know, players in the Iliad, who, um, you know, Agamemnon is the king of Mycenae, who, who leads out uh, his Greeks to invade Troy you know, because his wife is stolen. But all of this kind of heroic epic is kind of based around this period of conflict and destruction. There seemingly was a conflict between uh, Mycenae, Mycenae and the Hittite Empire uh, over the city of Ilion, which is the modern Troy, at Hisalik, in, in, at the mouth of the Dardanelles. Uh, but it was probably not a, but it was probably not a particularly apocalyptic conflict. It probably you know wasn't a thousand ships. It was just a, you know, a clash over a Bronze Age city, like like was happening all the time. But over the period of this apocalyptic period of collapse and destruction, when whole cities seemed to be in ruins, this conflict took on a kind of heroic dimension, took on a, a larger-than-life aspect. And hundreds of years later, it's remembered as the greatest war ever fought. And this is amazing because it shows that you can go from the collapse of Rome to the fall of Carthage to the collapse of Mycenae and Greece, in this chain of human memory of, of different societies that we've always thought back to the tragedies of collapse when we've faced our own crises. The, the role of walls and how walls show up in, in stories. You mentioned Troy. Troy had the, the, the great walls of Troy. Uh, you had the great walls of, of, of Uruk uh, in, in, in Sumer. Uh, again, uh, the interview I did uh, recently with Kathleen Duval about indigenous Native American civilizations that, that existed before Europeans got here, and I'm talking again within the borders of the United States. I'm not talking about the Mayan or, or Aztecs. I'm talking about within the United States. Um, she, she writes that it's when you start to see these stressors on civilization, including changes in climate, is when you do get the erection of walls is is this something that you have found yeah absolutely it's um it's usually a pretty good sign that things are going badly once you start talking about building a, a giant wall uh one particular example is in the collapse of the sumerian society uh this happened due to a, a multitude of factors some of them again environmental there was a, a period of uh, extended drought that caused a you know, long-term collapse of agriculture. There was also steady salination of the uh, agricultural lands very steadily over centuries, but the soil became saltier and saltier until it became more and more difficult to grow crops there. But this, uh, this environmental change was affecting all regions in the area and uh, tribal societies uh, in the mountains, in the Zagros Mountains of Iran, in the uh, Taurus Mountains of, of Turkey, were also feeling this uh, this pinch, you know, their uh, their nomadic lifestyle with their um, uh, what's the word? Yeah, so their pastoral lifestyle, uh, herding sheep and, and and cattle, was also you know becoming more and more difficult. And they took to raiding Sumerian lands, you know, relying on uh, on, on st stealing from the Sumerians what they could take. Uh, some of these were the Matu and the Guti. And they, some of these people were the Guti and the Matu. And during this time, the Sumerians were under great threat from these people who began flooding into the uh, Tigris Euphrates Valley in great numbers. And they started building a wall essentially between their two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, it was called sometimes the Matu Wall, sometimes the wall facing the highlands, but it essentially turned the uh, what's today called the Jazeera, the island, uh, the uh, land between the two rivers into a kind of fortress with the rivers as moats on either side and this wall between them. Uh, the wall has never been found, but it's, uh, it's attested in, in lots of texts of the time. You know, this was a, an act of desperation by a society facing collapse. And we see the same thing in you know, the Great Wall of China, which is built in the Ming Dynasty. Hmm. They were reacting to the immense destruction that had proceeded with the invasion of Genghis Khan and the Mongols and the uh, construction of the Yuan dynasty, which was eventually expelled from China. 
and this immense construction project at you know enormous expense was conducted as a result of, of these outside threats and it didn't end up helping in the end but um they were eventually toppled by the manchu but uh but you know you see the the desire to to protect people with this wall during periods of upheaval and strife so yeah building a wall is certainly one of these stre- stressor signs yeah and and as you as you talk about these these different walls and what was happening in society through time i mm-hmm. just can't help but then think about what is a major focal point in american politics today and that is the building of a wall on on the us mexican border mm-hmm. um yeah it's um i mean it's actually the it's the legacy of the 21st century so far is the construction of border walls. Uh, a vast majority of all the world's border walls have been built in just the last few decades. And they show an increasing desire to turn, you know, some of the wealthier countries in the world into, into fortresses that, you know, I think it becomes a, a pretty bad sign about how the people who rulers think the next century is going to go but there are going to be whole areas of the world where climate change hits with incredible ferocity where large areas may become unlivable you may get the collapse of major bread baskets the stress on agriculture in all areas um, civil wars uh, you know refugees having to leave these areas and it's pretty clear that um there's a kind of steady fortification of the countries that, uh, if we're honest, more or less caused the crisis in the first place. That, that's fascinating. Border walls are, are a modern phenomenon. Hmm. Well, you know, they've always existed to some extent, things like Hadrian's Wall, China's border defenses, uh, and so on. But um, but there now, there's now you know, more miles of border wall in the world than have ever existed. And from, you know, Gaza and the West Bank, from, uh, you know, the Saudi border with Yemen to the Australian coastal defenses. Uh, and you could, you know, maybe consider the, the Mediterranean, uh, you know, the, the, you can maybe consider the refugee regime in the Mediterranean a, a kind of moving wall. Uh, and as you say, the U.S. southern border, it's, uh, it shows that... Um, that modern industrial capitalism isn't providing for everyone in the world, that it's not working for everybody. And for those whom it is working for, they're increasingly feeling like they're having to defend themselves for those who aren't. The epilogue of of your book, Fall of Civilizations, really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. Um, And and in it, you, you sort of get into what does the study and looking at the fall of ancient and and past civilizations what does that mean for us today and as you very well point out you can never predict what's going to happen today or in the future but here are some trends that would probably be very useful uh to be uh mindful of and 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 one of them is is all civilizations fall. ours is going to fall And, and you do take on the sort of mental exercise of thinking about what future people will think about us and how they will see us or even what they will know about us because it's not we we seem to think what we have now will be eternal we know it won't be but something that's really important to think about is our mode of communicating with each other the in the digital age there's no Mm. guarantee that this is going to be accessible to future eras of 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 people Mm. yeah that's absolutely right i mean well, our period has sometimes been called a uh, digital dark age. Um, the term dark age is sometimes used pejoratively to describe a, a period of, um, of you know, like chaos and, and violence and so on. But, but historians use it to describe a period where we just don't have any sources, where nothing's being written down or anything that was written down hasn't survived. And it's kind of like a dark period in history where, you know, we just don't have access to, where that light I talked about earlier has simply vanished. We get that, for instance, in the collapse of Roman Britain, which, uh, unlike many other provinces in the Roman Empire, experienced a catastrophic collapse where virtually the entire economy disappeared overnight. Romanized cities were completely abandoned. 
London itself became a flooded ghost town where nobody lived and only scavengers rambled looking for remaining metal that could be reused because no metal was being mined anymore. No nails were being produced anymore. So coffins were no longer nailed together. Boots no longer had hobnails. All these classes of objects disappeared overnight. British people stopped eating stews because the pots that were used to make stews were no longer being produced. And they lost access to Roman market gardens. So they no longer ate parsley and coriander and other things. And for the next 200 years or so, nothing gets written down in Britain. So we have virtually no idea of what was happening there until the monk Gildas eventually writes uh, on the ruin and conquest of Britain, um, his De Exidio, which uh, kind of suddenly brings to light what might have been happening. And uh, although he's looking back with some distance, he gives us some sense of what was going on. And in some sense today, we're living through a similar dark age because our hard drives, our internet servers, our CD-ROMs, our floppy disks, just simply don't have the shelf life that uh, previous media had. Part of the reason we know so much about the Sumerians and not about, say, civilizations of similar antiquity that lived in the Danube, for instance, is because the Sumerians, A, lived in an extremely arid environment, and B, had the sense to write down their words on clay tablets. Clay tablets are extremely hard-wearing, so long as they're buried in enough sand. And if they're uh, subjected to a fire, such as the you know palace going up in flames, they're actually baked hard, and they're, they're actually hardened in the flames, which allows them to survive for thousands of years. Somewhere like the Danube is wet, it rains, uh, and people were writing probably on paper. Uh, so we, it, it, you know, we, we don't know what, what, what they were doing, what their names were, what their stories were. And to some extent, we're the same. Our digital media simply won't survive for that long. Some solid state hard drives do have a long life, uh, you know, perhaps a century uh, under good conditions. But whether anyone will have the means to read them if our industrial society collapses is another matter. Uh, and just thinking about our, our digital technology is 100% reliant on an electrical grid, an electrical mm. system, the same very system that is endangering uh, the future of civilization because of mm. climate, because of the way we produce electricity and power. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And I mean, as someone who, uh, you know, is a creator of digital media, the irony isn't isn't lost on me at all. That, you know, I, f I feel sometimes like I'm writing on sand. That's, that some of these things I'm making, you know, aren't, aren't going to maybe they aren't going to be accessible in, in even decades and a hundred years. You know, um, we've almost lost the ability to create things that endure, and even the things you know in our modern cities that look permanent and immovable, our skyscrapers, you know, our massive concrete buildings, are really not particularly durable you know a skyscraper will probably last for decades without maintenance but eventually some of the windows will break and once that happens the process is extremely quick the water intrudes uh, this creates you know damp it uh, seeps into the concrete you get plants growing trees put their roots through the steel beams that hold up the skyscrapers will slowly begin to rust and over time their integrity will degrade and it will happen faster than anyone imagines that some of these great edifices will come toppling down in the in, in the study of, of the fall of civilizations would show that it's quite common in history for people to abandon cities hmm. yeah i think that's something i i always want to get across and the show, the sense that nothing is inevitable and nothing is forever. The sense that someone who walked through the streets of Constantinople, you know, in, in the year 1200, someone who walked through the great city of Angkor in, in the Middle Ages or, or, or Uruk, strong walled Uruk in, in the Sumerian period, that they must have looked at their city and thought, this will last forever. This is so enormous, so permanent, the stone buildings are so strong, but this will be here in a thousand years. But some of them didn't realize that destruction was just around the corner and didn't appreciate how quickly that destruction could come and how total it could be. 
And if we do, if our era, if this period of time, uh, spanning probably several hundred years, uh, uh, does become considered a quote-unquote dark age, then that means future peoples will be making myths mm. about our time. Yeah, I, I always enjoy the irony that some of the earliest, um, that some of the longest continuous, that some of the longest continuously told stories feature a great flood that that drowned the world. You know, the Noah myth, uh, the uh, that's uh, derived from the flood myth that appears in Gilgamesh, and some of these stories are you know based on actual observed sea level rises that occurred at the end of the ice age and reached their peak around 5,000 years ago, just as Sumerian society burst onto the world stage and the planet's climate stabilized to the form we've enjoyed for the past you know 5,000 years, and that our society might actually see its end with the rise in, in sea levels that will come with climate change. This is partly due to melting glaciers, uh, you know, pouring water back into the seas, but it's also due to the just simple effect of water expanding on a hotter planet. You know, the I heard an amazing statistic that the amount of energy required to raise the entire planet's ocean by one centigrade is the same as five hydrogen bombs being let off under the ocean every second for 100 years, which is just a catastrophic amount of energy that is being increasingly placed into our oceans. It expands the water, and we're seeing you know, low-lying areas of the world already being flooded, but it also increases evaporation, which means more rainfall, more extreme weather events, more tornadoes. And American insurers today are paying out more for climate-related disasters than they ever have in any previous year. This shows that the future, to some extent, is already here, that the planet is becoming too energetic, too chaotic, and is actually steadily returning to the climate condition that it experienced in the period before human civilization rose up. And we might also assume a kind of condition that precluded the, the start of human civilization, that made human civilization impossible, that made agriculture, that made the weather too unpredictable for agriculture, that made climate events like floods and disasters too, too powerful for human cities to create sustainable uh, living conditions. So we're actually undoing the very thing, the very gift that was given to us that allowed us to begin our civilizations in the first place. Paul Cooper has been our guest again. Paul Cooper is the writer, producer, and host of the show, Fall of Civilizations, both a podcast and you could also find it on YouTube. And he is the author of the book, Fall of Civilizations, Stories of Greatness and Decline. Paul Cooper, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you so much, Mitch.